Hello. Uh, this is the second part of my video on the psychological ideas of the American philosopher William James. In his writings, James ranged widely over the whole developing field of psychology, discussing many different topics which he thought of interest. In some instances, he merely reported and summarized the work of others, as with topics linked to physiological psychology. Uh, but much of his work incorporated his own original insights. We only have time to deal with a few of these, uh, but we'll look at six topics. Uh, functionalism, the mind, consciousness, the self, will, and emotion. Jamesian psychology is usually labeled functionalism. This is because, having read Darwin, James believed that the mind's complex processes had evolved because of their adaptive value. So, to understand these processes, one had first to ask what functions they performed for preserving or enhancing life. This approach contrasted with that of the Wundtians, who believed that higher mental processes were assembled from simple elements and experience of the individual, by chance as it were, and with no underlying function. Regarding the mind, James emphasized the importance of mental states. He rejected the German physiological psychologist's belief that mental states were nothing more than physical states of the brain and of the nervous system. Not only was psychology at that time so underdeveloped that such dogmatism was premature, but for ordinary people, mental life was clearly experienced as something real. People unhesitatingly believed that they were thinking. The belief in mental processes was itself a datum which psychologists had to acknowledge. Indeed, for James, this was the most fundamental postulate in psychology, so that the proper study of psychology was the introspective analysis of the states of the mind that we are conscious of in daily life and of the functions they perform for us. Accepting the reality and importance of mental life raised ancient philosophical problems, however, notably the question of what the mind is and the relationship between mind and body. James rejected both the materialism of physiological psychology and dualistic perspectives such as Descartes, but decided that it was not yet possible to come to a definitive judgment on the matter. Therefore, for the moment, psychology should stay away from the whole mind-body question. It could not, as yet, specify the connections between physiological and mental states. Instead, for the present, psychology should focus on the naturalistic description and explanation of such mental processes as reasoning, attention, will, imagination, memory, and feelings. The ontological nature of the mind can be left, he said, to future generations to consider. In particular, psychologists should study consciousness. Whatever debates might preoccupy philosophers or theologians, here was an empirical reality which psychologists could study. Indeed, it was the most important datum they had to work with. Consciousness was central to mental life, and it could be studied by people whatever their metaphysical beliefs. For the psychologist, there was no need to postulate a separate watcher or soul in order to study consciousness. For James, consciousness was an activity of the brain, just as breathing is an action of the lungs. Consciousness was what the brain does. For James, consciousness should be seen as a process rather than a thing. An individual's consciousness was a continuum, a complex and unbroken stream of thought, rather than the traditional idea of consciousness being a series of linked experiences or thoughts, it was a teeming multiplicity of objects and relations in constant flow. It was the continuity of this stream of consciousness which gave us our sense of continuing selfhood and identity over time. As with other aspects of mental life, consciousness had survival value in Darwinian terms. It allowed the individual organism to steer a complex nervous system that had grown too complex to regulate itself. Through consciousness, an organism was able to consider past, present, and future states of affairs, and on the basis of its predictive power, plan ahead and adapt its behavior to circumstances. This increased the organism's chance of survival.
Turning now to the self, James believed that the most puzzling question for psychologists was who or what substance or entity knows that I am and enables each of us to have a sense of selfhood and continuous identity. The classic answer had been the soul or transcendental self, but Hume and Kant in the 18th century had shown that we can have no knowledge of such a self. Moreover, 19th century psychologists didn't observe or study it. Experimental psychologists didn't even discuss the self, and British associationists referred to it only as a connected chain of passing thoughts. Yet, in pragmatic terms, the belief in a principle of selfhood was an integral part of the common sense of humanity. This belief was an empirical reality, and it was necessary to find some way to be able to research it. A starting point was the recognition that consciousness was personal in nature. Thoughts are not just thoughts, but my thoughts or your thoughts. It is the sense of self that provides our sense of individual identity, that separates our own individual consciousness from that of others. It is this same sense of self that enables us to bridge gaps in consciousness, as, for example, when we go to sleep and then wake, and thus does not interrupt the sense of personal continuity through time. This empirical self consisted of several components. Firstly, the material self, defined not just by our own body, but also by our clothes, possessions, and home. Secondly, the social self, or selves, defined by who we are and how we behave in relation to other people in our lives, an anticipation of social psychology. And finally, the spiritual self, defined by a person's inner or subjective being, his or her entire collection of psychic faculties or dispositions. All three of these can be explored through introspection and observation. For James, will was one of the most important aspects of consciousness. It was the mind which was the cause of willed behavior. Much of human action was voluntary action. This was not an automatic response to external influences. When we desired something, we directed our voluntary actions towards attaining it, as with a toddler who sought to grasp a toy and endeavored to coordinate its movements until it was obtained. Our judgment of whether or not a particular thing is obtainable depends on our experience. We learn what our actions can achieve. If we judge that something that we want is unobtainable, then it remains a wish. Sometimes we feel conflicting desires as to what we want and weigh the alternative possibilities in our mind until one predominates and we act. Sometimes the choice is simple and immediate. Do I turn off the alarm clock and go back to sleep rather than rushing to work, for example? But at other times it is the result of protracted deliberation, like James's own lengthy internal debate about what career to follow. Crucially, in James's philosophy, voluntary action implies free will. This had personal importance to him in ending the lengthy period of uncertainty and depression which afflicted him in his late twenties. Influenced by the ideas of the French philosopher uh, Charles Renouvier, he found that consciously deciding to act as if he had free will enabled him to act and so recover from his emotional crisis. Philosophically, he remained aware of the arguments against free will and the attractions of scientific determinism. But at a purely pragmatic level, he felt that it was both sensible and necessary to believe in free will. As a result of believing in free will, we can consider alternatives. We can plan and act on our plans. If we believe in total determinism, we become passive and impotent. That is, a belief in free will is functionally useful regardless of whatever philosophical position we hold about its reality. James also noted, in rather moralistic terms, that a lack of will, as with alcoholics and drug addicts, was socially pathological, as also was the sense of hopeless failure. We have a duty, it would seem, to exercise our own willpower. By the 1920s, with the rise of behaviorism as the dominant paradigm in American psychology, interest in the psychology of will in general declined dramatically. Only in the 1960s 
did interest in Jamesian philosophical questions about will revive in such topics as intentionality, decision-making, and self-control. Finally, James's ideas on emotion have also attracted considerable attention. Both James and, independently, the Danish psychologist Karl Langer proposed a radically new conception of how emotion worked, what became known as the James-Langer theory of emotion. According to them, it was not the psychological emotion which caused the bodily symptoms associated with it, but rather the nervous system's own response to perception of an external event which produced both the physical symptoms and the emotional label we attach to a particular set of symptoms. Thus, we feel sorry because we cry, we feel angry because we have struck out, we feel afraid because we are trembling, and so on, and not the other way around. This hypothesis attracted a lot of subsequent attention and research. Although not supported, it provided a major stimulus to the development of modern theories of emotion and emphasized the important role of physiological arousal in emotional states. Someone only feels angry or sad or afraid if there is also physiological arousal. Thank you.